Salutations, fellow readers, writers, and killers of time on YouTube. My name is Martha Jones, and I am here in what some would consider my most provocative apparel to ask you honestly, is my ensemble evocative of anything other than lust? Feel free to file that away in your temporary storage while I use the androgynous sounds of my voice to share with you a few words about erotica versus pornography. Many years ago, in a land that would eventually become Italy, there was a sculptor named Michelangelo who had a keen eye for anatomy and specialized in uncanny representations of biblical figures because he was obsessively good at his job and the checks from the Vatican seldom bounced. One of his most famous works was and is his sculpture of David, the giant killer, in his shepherding days long before he was king of Israel. A sculpture that is somewhat less famous than Michelangelo's David is Michelangelo's David's fig leaf, an absurd relic from the Counter-Reformation of the mid-1500s when Pope Julius II condemned nudity in the arts as the trappings of paganism. This led to some naughty-minded numbskulls at the Council of Trent approving the widespread censorship of the arts, sometimes called the Fig Leaf Campaign, and for some time thereafter to the obfuscating of King David's, uh, scepter. Fortunately, this, quote, Fig Leaf Campaign, unquote, has largely been recognized through the lens of history as the silliness it always was, and stands, or rather flaccidly rests, as a giggle-worthy reminder that there are prudes of every generation who see everything as dirty and think the world should shrink to accommodate their minds rather than their minds expand to accommodate the world. The problem with these perennial prudes is they are loud and they occasionally get their way, which indeed leads to a censoring of the arts. A thing that everyone pretty much agrees is bad, though no one seems to be able to agree what censorship and the protection of public decency ought to be in the eyes of the law. To further confound matters, laws governing things like public decency, at least here in the United States, tend to be vaguely enough written that words like pornography and exposure tend to mean whatever the local inhabitants say they mean. Not good. Large portions of those local inhabitants believe Transformers, Little Mermaid, and Deep Throat are all equally pornographic and worthy of censorship. The best defense I have found personally against these backward ideas is to educate ourselves on things like genre nuance and basic terminology so that we don't accidentally feed those backward ideas and encourage them to grow. And as we in agricultural communities are well aware, growth often occurs where manure is the thickest. As far as my own knowledge quest for nuance, among words like erotica and pornography, I started at the Online Etymology Dictionary, which, right, I know what you're gonna say. The way words started out aren't always relevant to how they are used in the discourse. And beginning our talks with dictionary definitions have been done to death by channels that are way less lovable than mine. But in this instance, I think the word origins are worth a mention. See, while graphy is Greek for to write, Porno comes from porni, the root of which is pair, to traffic or sell. The first pornography ever is thought to be of prostitutes on the walls of the temple of Bacchus, the Greek party god. So almost from the coining of the phrase, pornography has been closely tied to the buying and selling of sex. Erotica is similar in that it tends to depict one or more sex act per artistic rendering, but its root word heavily pertains to Eros, the god of love. Granted, Eros's brand of love is carnal and pretty much exclusively fueled by high-octane lust, but at least as far as the ancient Greeks were concerned, it was still a legitimate form of love. I think artists might be better equipped to understand the intimate pleasure one gets from an art object than some folks. Like, I'm assuming your name isn't Pygmalion and you don't literally want to bone a statue, but just about any artistic endeavor, be it in marble, stained glass, or the written word, takes time and attention to make it a thing worth looking at. You don't, for example, spend three years of your life sculpting the sinew and veins of young David if your only goal is to arouse the viewer. You could just as easily do that with a stick figure and a pair of kumquats. Kumquat. Now there's a word of comic significance if ever I heard one. Weren't you glad I didn't say banana? Anyway, ancient origins aside, and in fairness to smart people who disagree with me, there are industry pros in Common Era who don't think it's fair to draw hard lines between pornography and erotica. Sex worker rights activist, pornographic film producer, and star Carol Lee insists that pornography doesn't have to be degrading or artless, and that in attempting to vindicate erotica, we risk the potential villainization of an already marginalized group of professionals. And I think Ms. Lee has a point. Sex workers are wrongfully demonized a lot, and anything we can do to reaffirm their basic humanity I think is a good thing. I also agree that pornography shouldn't have to be degrading. I can see it as being potentially empowering, also due to its inherently transgressive nature, there is all kinds of freedom to explore a satire, taboo, and inclusiveness. The pornographic industry, and I guess the arts at large, are a bit like the circus in that, yes, it can be exploitative. I cannot possibly oversell the achiness of the exploitation aspect. But like the circus of old, a lot of things about us as humans that are not universally lauded or even accepted are encouraged and put on display for money. I can't help but think that that could be affirming for folks that are between genders, amputees, hyperflexible, Super heavy, super short, heavily tattooed, 
whatever about you that you've been told is unacceptable all your life is not only somebody's kink, but somebody's vanilla. Nevertheless, as authors and as self-marketers, it makes good economic sense for us to understand genre norms as completely as possible, including what might separate pornography from erotica and, while we're at it, erotica from romance. If, for example, our books are more sex-driven than character-driven and we seek our audience principally among shy, unassuming romance readers, we might forfeit the right to act surprised at our disappointing sales and our disappointed readers. Or if we've taken the pains to write an entertaining story around our sex scenes, then attempt to market them to pornography consumers whose patience for build-up might be limited due to sheer habit. Whose fault is it that they didn't enjoy themselves? So first and foremost, erotica and romance are definitely not the same thing. While there can be some interactive nakedness in romance, it is always in service of the love story. Always, always, always. I say this in hopes that you will never ever meet someone who attempts to use your interest in romance to justify their pornography addiction. But in that unlikely circumstance, rest assured that that justification is about as solid as a curling iron on a stand of jello. Second and foremost, eh, whatever comes after foremost, when honestly assessing a work for whether it is pornographic or merely erotic, after reading up on the opinions of some folks that are better informed than I am, I would be inclined to ask the following questions. One, is this art evocative of emotions other than lust? Erotic art wants you to think about it even after it's out of your sight, whereas pornography tends to have a singular and uncomplicated objective about which the point is not ambiguous. Immediate arousal sans foreplay. Two, how is this work presented to the public? Not necessarily in the context of what belongs on a pedestal versus what belongs on a pole. Cause spoilers, all humans are beautiful in their way, and the world might be a better place if we treated them like they all belonged on pedestals. But like other genres, a good copywriter can convey the gist of the intent of the art through something as simple as how they craft their pitch. A chilling tale of unlikely lovers teaming up to perform under pressure and overcome challenges including death is not necessarily a better pitch than zombie strippers on ice, but one of these descriptions is clearly emphasizing the efficiency of an entertaining gimmick, while the other is slightly more oriented toward characters and theme. And three, how loving is the artist's eye toward their subject matter? While we can't presume to know an artist's heart or the hidden depths of love such a heart may hold for any one project, a viewer familiar with the medium can likely tell at a glance a work that took a lot of time and attention from one that was assembled on borrowed time and materials. To the credit of the pornographers, they tend to be incredibly practical and don't necessarily spend endless hours and resources on high-quality projects when a low-quality project will yield the same results. When an object of given art has enough depth that it is worth looking at more than once, that might be a clue that the artist sees something in that subject that is worthy of their love and ours, not merely our arousal. As always, thank you for giving these videos a shot. If by chance you find yourself with more money than time and a heart to help with IRL efforts to de-villainize and increase the visibility of sex workers, I would ask you very sweetly to visit a site called urbanjustice.org. Until we meet again, take it easy. Loves you. Bye. Like my channel, buy my crap, do da do da. There's no time to take a nap. Oh, the do da day. Hey! Some minor adjustments, darling. Not for my vanity, but for humanity.